But let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Exodus in chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened, Pharaoh's, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing, in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night, without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land." And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels, so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to its, normal play, to its normal course. When the morning appeared, when the morning appeared, 
And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of the Lord. We live in a fear-driven world. A fear-driven world. You turn on just about any news channel and watch long enough and something about climate change will come up. I'm not saying climate change is not real. But there it will be, whether it's a movie you're watching or some piece of information that has come out or some new policy for companies and how they ought to operate that are warning of the doom and gloom that are about to come upon the whole earth. You're all about to perish. Be afraid. Lessen your carbon footprint in this world. Or then you have the politicians. The politicians pointing to the other politician who's running up against them. And informing you of the different things and policies that they have and how scary they are. And how if that particular politician makes it into office, it shall be the end of us. Be afraid and vote for me. This is typically how it goes. Or maybe you're more familiar with WebMD. Which is going to explain to you how the people on your right cheek is a sign of a certain strain of smallpox. That if you study deep enough and go through enough articles online, you will find out indeed you are doomed and you ought to be afraid. It's the world we live in. Fear is something that drives finances, politics, business, whether it's insurance or any other thing. We are accustomed to living either terrified or spreading that fear to others. It's simply the way the world works, which we should not be surprised about because as soon as sin entered into the world, Genesis 3, what happened immediately? Fear was right there. And they ran and they hid themselves. It should not surprise us because, because the, the number one commandment in the scriptures, do you know what it is? You know what it is by now. I've kind of led you on that particular direction. It is do not be what? Afraid. It's one version or another of that. It shouldn't surprise us then that God's people, God's people are called to live in an exceedingly different way when it comes to this particular issue. Fear. The passage we have just read is going to explain to us why. Why is it that we as Christians can be able to heed that primary command that covers the scriptures beginning to the very end? Why is it that we're able to live contrary to those who are in terror around us? Genesis, Exodus 14 is going to exhort us to not fear For it is Yahweh, it is God, who fights your foes for you. Do not be afraid, for it is God who fights your foes for you. I have labeled the passage we are about to walk through in two main portions. One is a frightening king, and the other one is a fighting king. A frightening king and a fighting king. King, fastly, a frightening king. Israel sees the enemy and fears. Look down to verse 8 of, of, of chapter 14 together with me. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Do you see that? 
That's what was happening in them. Uh, the, 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 uh, the plagues are done. Ten plagues have come down upon Egypt. Egypt, the former captors of Israel, have been decimated. God's people are stepping out in confidence. They are looking one to the other, speaking about all that has gone down. Did you see that? What, what did you get? They've plundered the Egyptians, haven't they? They have rings and necklaces and all manner of treasures that they have brought out. Maybe they're doing some butter trade as they, as they walk out. You know, they're confident. Egypt was not able to hold us back. Our God is mighty. That's the idea. They are, they are defiant. And this is the posture that they are in as they are going out. But then it tells us in verse 10 that when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians. You see, this is completely unexpected. One moment, they are defiant and leaving Egypt with confidence. The next minute, they behold. The way it's phrased, it's really a, a shock value that happens here. That changes their, their, their hearts entirely. A 180 shift. It's like, it's like going downstairs when you're in your house all alone. All alone. And you bump into someone in the dark of the kitchen. The activity might have suddenly changed, isn't it? What, what you were going for might have been a glass of milk. Uh, oh, that's more in the movies. You never wake up for a glass of milk in the middle of the night. You, you are going to get this or that. And you turn and you bump into someone. You have to jump out of your skin. That's what's going on here. Everything is fine. They're living. Everything is so good. Did you see? Are you? And then they lift up their eyes. And right there, the most terrifying thing that you can imagine. What a man in your kitchen. But the most powerful army on earth that is bent towards your destruction. They hate you. They hate that you've left them. And they have all the capabilities and capacity, motivation and all, to absolutely decimate you. That's what this group sees as they're living out. What's about to happen is a battle, isn't it? It's all set up very, very quickly. But it's not a fair battle. These are not two equal forces if you look at the Israelites by themselves and the, and the Egyptians who are coming up after them. This is, this is more of a scene where on the one hand you have an elite group of commandos armed to the tooth, night vision goggles and everything, sniper weapons in battle formation, closing in tactically, on a group of stranded tourists <laughs> who have way too much luggage <laughs> lost at the airport. That's what you have on one side and the other. Not a fair battle by any measure. If you look at this, all you expect is not a fight. You expect a massacre. And that's exactly how they see themselves, this nation of Israel. They are geographically disadvantaged. They have nothing as far as that's concerned. They have boxed themselves in. That's exactly why the passage begins by describing the geography as they do. The sea on the one side, the cliff on the other side, and their only way out, the Egyptian army is coming in, closing them in. You see, these people are slaves. They're not trained warriors as they live out, even though they are equipped for battle. They're slaves. And so they very quickly revert to that. They might have been slaves. Now they've been set free. But they very quickly revert to what they were. Did you see that lecture that they give to Moses? A set free people who immediately begin talking like the slaves that they were. Because what they have seen coming is their former slave masters. 
And all that they can see that is standing between themselves and him and themselves and that particular army is, is a little 80-year-old man with a single stick. Now this is us, isn't it? Isn't this us? We can boast about God. We can boast about how good God is. We can boast about how sure his promises are. And then in the middle of the week, we come across something, something, whatever it is. A text message, some piece of information. And it is as though everything that we knew has been undone and it all unravels. Because that is what we are accustomed to. This is who we were. We were used to be a fearful people who live in fear-mongering communities. And so the instincts are all too ready to revert to what we used to do, which is be ye terrified. Forgetting and losing complete sight of that massive thing that has happened, which is that God's people have been delivered out of slavery and they have been set free by this king. When we see the possibility that our employment might be coming to an end, we fear. When we see a medical report that has some bad news, we fear. When we see the dangers that will face us if we choose to go out amongst the nation to spread the fame of his name, we fear. When we see that our reputation is on the line, we fear. When we see death knocking on our door or death knocking on the door of our beloved one, we fear. When we see that we might have to start all over again from scratch, we fear. We fear being rejected. We fear losing control. We fear because we are so aware of all that we can lose, all the pain that we can experience. We are impressed by the power of everything else to do us harm. The power that governments have. The power that bullies at your high school or primary school have. The power that family members or bosses or sin or death have. And so we have become Fear addicts, even though we are Christians, we have looked just like the world when it comes to this topic. And this command that is so primary in the scriptures in many ways has become something that we've not tried or worked hard to grow beyond and to look like the people that we have been called to be by our God. You know, what's interesting about this passage is that this lesson the salvation that the Lord was going to work, was meant to put on display a lesson for the Egyptians. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's the point, said twice in this section. It's the Egyptians who don't know that Yahweh is God. But you see, when troubles come, you see what immediately happens? Who doesn't seem to know that Yahweh is God? It's God's children that don't know that Yahweh is God. For when they lifted up their eyes and looked and saw the Egyptian army, they were terrified. What's interesting with that is it's very similar to what you see in the Gospels with the disciples. The lessons often tell that Jesus is teaching to, to, to the unbelievers in the crowds who are coming. Many different times you will see the disciples acting in ways that look more like the unbelievers that Jesus is confronting than the people who truly ought to know who Jesus is. Very often, Jesus is asking them, do you not yet understand? Have I not shown you this already? Isn't it? Like there's something here that you're not quite getting. There's something here that they're not quite getting. The narrative of the disciples really changes with that massive event that wraps up all the Gospels. And in the book of Acts, they act in such different ways than the ways in which they acted before. You see, the defect with Israel is not so much what they see when they look up. It's really more about what they do not see. Look with me back in chapter 13. Back in chapter 13 and verse 21, we're given the context for the very portion of scripture we're about to read. Look at verse 21 of chapter 13. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from the people. 
did not depart from the people. So question, no points for this, no cookies for this. Who was right there with them? God was right there with them. God was right there with them in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God wasn't with them in a hidden way. God was with them in a very visible way. God wasn't with them sometimes, but not other times. God was with them, we are told, all the time. It was God who was leading them as that pillar. And they were following him wherever they went. He was right there. So do you see? When they lifted up their eyes to look, what should they have seen? It's right there before them. They should have seen the Lord, but they did not see the Lord. They looked right past him. You know what's interesting is there might be a play of what going, go, go, going on here. Because that word Migdol, which is where they are, it's, it's, really, it's really the word watchtower. That's where they're gathered. That's where God has taken them. When it comes to what you're seeing, they were in a place, a, a vantage point of being able to see exactly what was going down. This was all really a setup. Do you see that from the very beginning of chapter 14? Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and then camp in front of Pihahiroth. He is putting them exactly where he wants them. God is in full control. Oh, he has demonstrated his full control in Egypt already by decimating all of their gods, by decimating that land. He has shown himself to be the one and only true God. And that hasn't changed. He, that same God of the ten plagues, is the God who is visibly there amongst them. That has positioned them perfectly. Because he is orchestrating an event that he will use to put his name on display. So that his fame might spread amongst all the nations. This is what they should have seen. That the Lord is governing all of, the all of the affairs that concern his people. This is the same reality for us. The, the power of God is shown in multiple ways here. He says exactly what Pharaoh will do. What does Pharaoh do? Exactly what God said he would do. He goes a step even further. He acts in Pharaoh to harden his heart. To ensure that that very path you have taken, you will go all the way to the end. That's how this particular phrase, proportion, phrases it. I know exactly what he will do. He does exactly that. And here's what he will do. He will underestimate me. That's really it. Pharaoh has such a low estimation of Yahweh that what Pharaoh will think is, Yahweh is lost in the wilderness. He, he doesn't know his way out. I've got him. He still doesn't fear the Lord. And that's exactly how Pharaoh acts. When he's told what has happened, he says, they're lost. They're lost in the wilderness. And God hardens his heart. He sovereignly ensures that Pharaoh follows through with exactly that towards the very purposes that God has decreed. He will bring about the end that he has decreed. Nothing can thwart God's counsel. There's not a man or machine no might or mess, no medical mystery, no mean mugging manager, no his excellencies or his majesties that compare to our God. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. This story plays out exactly as God had planned that it would. But when the Israelites lift up their eyes, they do not see that God. Their God, omnipotent, is not the God they see. Their God, who is their warrior king, who is going out before him, before them, that is not what they see. What they see is their greatest fear, their enemy coming out to get them. This is oftentimes our case. A dissonance between the reality that is ours in Christ as those who have been set free 
From that which we feared, that's how Hebrews in chapter 2 verse 14 speaks about it, and it speaks about death. And yet we oftentimes live in between these two things. We have truly been saved. And this is what we were. But the experiences in our hearts are oftentimes just like the Israelites. It's a true little statement that we quote on the streets when we say you can take a man out of the village, but it is another thing to take the village out of the man. You can take a man out of slavery, but it is another thing to take the slavery out of the man. That individuals who have truly been set free from sin and all of its consequences. That individuals who have been set free from death and all of its bitter reality. That has been taken away. And yet we can still live as those who are absolutely slaves to those realities. Moses proposes a cure. And here's the cure. C, a fighting king. Point number two, a fighting king. Israel sees their God and fears. Israel sees their God and fears. After the Israelites were done giving Moses his, his annual review, as far as how he was performing in his work, Moses finally gets a word in. And here's what Moses says to them. Verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. I like that you have only to be silent. It's like where all the problems are emerging from their mouth. You know, did we tell you? We would have, yeah, yeah, just, just, just keep quiet. That's all you need to do. It's, it's really Moses' version of be still and see the salvation of the Lord. This is more like keep quiet. I won't use a more crass phrase for that. Keep quiet and see the salvation of the Lord. Do not fret is what's going on here. This, this, this little formula, if you so please, is really the gospel formula for us, isn't it? The, the Exodus is the primary redemption event in the Old Testament. It's hands down. It's not a competition between this one and, and also that one. This is it. This is the thing that everything that follows looks back to. The same way that everything that follows the cross looks back to it. When you're, when, you're, when you're reading ahead and you get to Exodus 20, it looks back here. I am the Lord your God who set you free from Egypt. Ten commandments come out of that. In the book of Leviticus, as, as the sacrificial system is being laid out, time and time and time and time again, this is the event that is being referred to again. What are we to learn from this? This is how God saves. You do nothing God does everything. That's how it works. That's how the true gospel works. You do nothing. Meditate on nothing. If your understanding even of repenting and believing is something, you haven't understood it yet. Because that formula will have you getting saved and looking back at your, you really repented. And you really believed. That's not how they're saved. They are told to basically stand back. And on Migdol, that watchtower, basically, watch this. Watch me doing all the fighting for you. You get the salvation. Because it is God who has done all the fighting. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, please do not leave this place without understanding or hearing this one thing. And if you're sitting where you're sitting and the reason you have not come to Christ is because you're still trying to fix yourself, to make yourself a little bit more presentable to God. If you're looking at the Christian life and you're saying, me, I can't, 
I would love to do that Christian life thing, but me, I can't. Because me, I'm so weak. Me, I'm so much into my sin. I'm, I, 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 shh. Hear the gospel. It's not about you and your powerlessness. Oh, we already know about that. In fact, you most probably don't grasp it enough. The scriptures describe you as being dead in your trespasses and sins. Have you ever seen a dead man do anything for himself? Ever? Ever seen a dead man even scratch himself a little bit because he's itchy? Can't do anything for himself. You cannot save yourself. Here is the good news. God has sent his son and his son has worked salvation fully for you. He has borne the burden of your sin that you couldn't bear. And he has drunk the cup of wrath that you deserve. The judgment that you deserve. And he has emptied that cup to its dregs to the very last iota of wrath that was towards you. He, it has all been emptied out on the cross on your behalf. Another way of saying it, Jesus has fought for you. All you're being invited to do is look to him. Trust in him. Rest in him. So I plead with you today. But even as you hear the rest of this sermon, but you shall be hearing with ears of faith that we prayed for you earlier that the Lord would grant to you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That is what they've been invited to see. The Egyptians you see today, you shall never see again. And the action begins, people. The way the passage goes, verse 15, there's a heightened sense of urgency that immediately kicks in. <laughs> it, you, 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 you need to step into it. And you, 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 you hear the, the commands from your captain. There's an urgency to it. It's not a chit-chat anymore. The battle is on. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Moses, you've seen this before. We've done this before. What are you waiting for? Get at it. Verse 19, the angel of the Lord, we are told, he repositions himself. Then the angel of the Lord who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. You know, it's interesting when it says the angel of the Lord, it's, 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 it's there's the Lord and then there's the angel of the Lord. And we've been told already quite clearly that it is Yahweh who fights this battle. It is God who's going to fight this battle. And I think there's little images, not clearly seen as far as the doctrine of the Trinity, but you're going to see faint little images, even as early on as this, that point to us that our God is three um, in one. He is a triune God. The angel of the Lord moves to the back. It is he again who is doing all of the fighting. He stops the, 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 the army of Egypt in their tracks. Think about it. That army, with all of their capacity, they are right there. Egypt, Israel is right here. But you know what stands between the two of them? God. And they cannot do the harm that they are so eager to do to Israel. It's like a caged dog with meat on the other side of the cage. Can try to do all it wants to do with the teeth. Can't extend far enough. Remove its hand and claw. Can't reach it. God has drawn the exact line. And is like, this is as far as you will go. And not an inch farther. And it is God who is standing right there. Ensuring that that happens. Verse 21, a powerful east wind blows. This is all the work of the Lord. And the waters are divided. They are parting and they are coming together is how Israel will be saved and how Egypt will be defeated. Again, I think Moses, who is writing all of, the, uh, all, of, all of these five books, is giving to us, has given to us this imagery multiple times. We had it at the very beginning, didn't we? Of, of Genesis 1 and verse 2. Before that first act of creation, you're told that the waters covered the earth. 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over them. We saw that again in chapter 8 of the book of Genesis when, when it was now Noah and the flood and the waters covered the earth. And we are, we are told of the wind blowing and, and pushing back basically the, 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 the waters that had covered the earth, bringing judgment upon the world. And here again you're seeing the waters that are being blown at by God. And they're creating dry ground for the children of God to be able to walk on. The waters are of no consequence to this God. It's a little creation imagery. As the first act of creation was, and even that work of Noah was a little hint towards a new creation, you have it yet again. God is going to ultimately create a new humanity for himself. His power will get it done. All of them shadows pointing to the ultimate work which Christ will do to create a people for himself and ultimately a new creation for himself. Verse 23, read it carefully. This is what this whole story has been about. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. Did you catch it? I tried to emphasize it as I read. Here it goes. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Did you catch how many times that was repeated? All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots. Maybe, maybe seven times in this little, this little chapter. Over. This is what they were afraid of. This was it. The, the thing that they lifted up their eyes and saw was this. It's like if you're trying to counsel the Israelites and you're in your counseling room and they're lying on the couch. What they would tell you was, but you really don't know. I mean, it's Pharaoh. That's a thing by itself. It's his chap. His chariots, I mean, those things are like cutting edge, you know, bomber fighters that have stealth. And do, you, do you not understand what I'm telling you? They could destroy us like, by just looking at us badly. <laughs> like, do you not understand what I'm saying to you? I am afraid of something real. And you haven't heard of his famed, terrifying horsemen. So in this section, it is said over and over and this is who God is coming up against. And so they go in. Verse 23. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them. Into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces. <laughs> it's too good. Here's how the narrative is going. They're walking out defiantly. You saw them? They're walking out defiantly. And then we're told, they do what with their eyes? They lift up their eyes and they see Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, and they are terrified. But now what are we being told? When the worst that could possibly happen actually happens, the cloud has now allowed them, now you can go. Now you can charge against them. Now you are, you are released to chase them. And this is what they were terrified. We are told that the Lord does what? Looks down upon them. As far as height goes, the problem that the nation of Israel has when they looked up is that they did not look up enough. Because if they had looked up enough, not just to the Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his chariots, but they had looked up farther to see the cloud that was hovering even above Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Who would they have seen there? The Lord, Yahweh, their fighting king, their God omnipotent is who they would have seen. And so we are told that these ones whom Israel looked up to, God looks down upon them. If the fight we described was truly imbalanced, wasn't it? This army versus Egypt versus Israel is like, is like a boot and an ant. Is that a fight? You're right. But, but, but what about the one who says the earth is his footstool? If you bring him into the story. And he's the one who is now fighting with the boot. 
Ever seen those images that, that zoom out on a couple lying down on grass? Ever seen those? And they zoom back out like this, and they keep going, and eventually you see the continent and the water, and then you see the earth, and then you see the Milky Way, and then you just keep going to things I have not studied enough to tell you about. <laughs> and you think to yourself, like, scope-wise, that people have totally disappeared. Yes, the God who made all of that by simply saying, let there be stars, who is now here fighting for Israel. This is how the fight is going down. It is not them who are fighting. It is God who is fighting for them. And what Moses asked them to do is this. See it. See the salvation that the Lord will work for you today. See it. All you're seeing is your enemy. I need you to see your God who fights for you. You see, well titled, really, this sermon should be titled Divine Ophthalmology. I saw an ophthalmologist last week. But that's what really God is fixing here. You don't see right. Your vision is messed up. Because all you see is WebMD. All you see is this and that. All you see is a financial... All, that's all you see. And you tremble at all the possibilities of all that could ever possibly go wrong. And then those fears rule you. I'm not speaking against prudence here. I'm saying let's not call prudence what is actually fearfulness, which is what God's people here and forever are being asked to never do, to never allow to control them because of this one simple reality. It is the Lord, your God, who fights for you. Well, you know how this story wraps up. We've just read it. They're all destroyed. No surprises there. And in the midst of the battle, the Egyptians cry out, let us get away from Israel because Yahweh is fighting for them against Egypt. <laughs> we are not really scary people. Something here that's telling us about God's people. We're, we're really not that impressive. Have you seen that? So as though they said, these guys have skills we didn't know of. Let's pull back. We are like lambs in front of lions when it comes to most things. Even the ones I've mentioned jokingly, like climate change and dangers about the future, school fees for your kids and illnesses. And those are serious things, all of them, isn't it? And they actually could harm us in that regard. It does make sense if you don't factor in God to be afraid. The power is not in us. The power is not in us. The thing that completely changes the equation is God and what God has done that he has chosen to go out and fight. And so Exodus 14 is saying, have faith, not fear, for it is Yahweh who fights your foes for you. This simple lesson, people, continues on in the rest of Moses' writing. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29 to 32. It's the same lesson. How are they supposed to go into the land? By remembering this lesson. But they didn't remember the lesson. Because the book of Numbers and all its events, sadly, come between the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. And so you remember what happened when they went? What happened when they went? What did the spies come back and report? We are like what? Grasshoppers in their sight, in their presence. These guys are giants. What, what are they looking at? It's the same thing again, isn't it? So Moses rebukes them, Deuteronomy 129. So I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God, who, the Lord your God who goes before you will fight for you, just as you saw him do for you in Egypt. And you saw in the wilderness how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all along the way. You traveled until you reached this place. The same lesson. You saw, you saw. 
Deuteronomy 3, 21 to 22. And I commanded Joshua at the time, your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. This is the lesson. God does the fighting. We get the saving. That's how this math works. That's how the people of God are meant to move forward to that which God has called them to. And how is it then that eventually when the next generation actually entered into the land and actually encountered success and victory and they actually conquered lands. Listen to Joshua chapter 23 and verse 10. One man of you puts to flight a thousand. Why? Since it is the Lord your God who fights for you just as he promised. Not because you're deadly, not because you're amazing, not because you have really interesting spears. And you, No, no, no. That's how the other nations boast. The other nations boast about the king that they have, who is head and shoulders above every other man. The other nations boast about the number of horses that they have, the kind of battle armor that they put on. But it shall not be so with the people of God. They boast in their God who fights for them. And isn't that the sandwiching of the book of Joshua then? Chapter 5? The one who appears to him, to Joshua? It is as the commander of the army of the Lord of hosts that I am now come. With his, with his sword out of its sheath. This is how it shall, it is God who will get it done. God will get it done. Samuel is the same story, isn't it? And Saul giving armor to little David and him tossing all those things out. And once he, once he slaughters um, Goliath, what does he say? David said to the Philistine, you come against me with dagger, spear, and sword, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh of hosts. The God of Israel, Israel's armies, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I will strike you down and cut off your head and give your corpse, the corpses of, of the Philistines' camp to the birds of the sky and to the creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord sa saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. The battle is the Lord's. That's the story of the scriptures. So you shouldn't be surprised that all that this is shadowing and pointing to is fulfilled in Christ. That when it comes to our salvation, that we have not been asked to contribute anything but the sin that has made that salvation necessary. And that that salvation is all encapsulated in what he has accomplished for us. He has fought our primary enemy, sin and death. The foundations that have been laid for a life that is not driven by fear for the Christian have been laid deep, as deep as Christ's death. Which he defeated when he rose up from the grave three days ago, three, three days after he died. And ascended up on high. So when you come to the very end of the Bible, you have the book of Revelation. And what you have there is a people who are buffeted right, left, and center by many things that they can be afraid of. John is writing this from prison. Emperors have risen up against God's people. God's people are being fed to lions for the entertainment of the masses. Is it scary following God, following Jesus in a time like that? It must be frightful. There are those who live in what... Jesus calls where, where Satan's throne is, where there's such heightened activity that is demonic, that is of the enemy himself who seeks to do you harm. It's not slight things. They were a buffeted church. So what is given to them? A vision is given to them of how things truly are. And that vision is of a Christ who has conquered. As read from the beginning to the very end of Revelation. It is a vision of a conquering king, Jesus. He shows up at the very beginning of the book of Revelation in all his glory. Eyes like fire, feet like bronze, a voice like many waters. 
This is how he shows up as a conquering king. And, 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 and in chapter 5 of Revelation, you have John weeping, weeping. Because who is going to bring about all of God's purposes and promises? Who will bring it to pass? And why is he told to weep no more? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And when he sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, you know what he sees? The lamb as though what? Slain. What Christ has accomplished for us on the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection has addressed everything that we could ever possibly be afraid of. Sin fully dealt with. Completely. So that the standing that we have in Christ is one of perfect assurance. Death. Oh, death, where is your what? Who speaks like that? Is that saying we won't cry by gravesides? Oh, we'll cry. We'll cry. We'll weep. We'll hurt. But not like the Gentiles do. Isn't it? Isn't that always the distinction? Always the distinction? That there's such a massive difference because of one thing. What Jesus Christ has accomplished for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. So saints, let us boast in this. May we not be those who live and think and feel and act as though Jesus half died and half rose and half ascended. Yeah, kind of. We have secure. But we speak about all the bad things now that could happen to us, and then, and then live in fear. It's not the way of the Bible. It's not the way of the saints. Let us plant deep in our lives here as a community this story. Let it resonate deeply so that constantly we have it in the background as the cause for hoping, as the cause for boasting, as the cause for not despairing. As the cause for saying we are struck down, but not crushed. This is the reason why. Not because of our financial resources. Not because I know a guy. Not because I do this or I do that. But because Jesus Christ has won on our behalf. So let me ask you. Are you afraid? The answer is yes. So let me ask you a different question. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? And, and how does what Christ has done for you address it? Is it that you have never thought of, of, of leaving the comforts of your home and this city to go out for the sake of his name because, because the thought of pain, suffering, persecution, the, 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 the hardships of South Sudan, or the, or the racism that you'll experience in some Arab countries? I just too much. Of course, that's not God's will for me. Amen? Couldn't ever be. Is a fear of physical pain keeping you from doing what God has called you to do? Or maybe it's not that. Maybe... Maybe it's actually pursuing the community that we've been called to right here at TBC. And maybe what you're afraid of is not so much a sword. You're like, that I can face. What I can't face is to talk to a stranger. You don't understand how terrifying that is. Because the, the fear of being rejected, that I could go and say hi to three guys, and, and then they, they look at me funny, they you know, give me two polite sentences and kind of move on with their story and what that would do to me? Pastor, you don't understand. It would shatter me inside completely. So let's just play it safe, amen? Let's just play it safe. Never talk to anyone. Never face rejection. Sounds like a working formula to me. So just kind of live in disobedience to everything the New Testament says about the local church. Never opening up my home. Because when people see, they will notice how chaotic my kids are. And they will judge me and condemn me for not being a good parent. Come on, parents. I know this is where you are. 
So once my kids are able to recite catechisms at dinner, <laughs> at least one to number 50 something, so it doesn't look like I, I just began before I invited them, <laughs> then maybe I'll welcome them to my home. Or my home is so small, I don't live in a nice place, it's a dingy neighborhood, and you know, they come and I'll be ashamed. Because maybe the food I'll put up for them, or they in my house, what are you afraid of? Or maybe we can't confess our sins one to another as a congregation, as a community. Because if they really know, if they really know, they'll reject me. They'll never look at me the same way again. Question, hasn't the cross addressed all of this? As a community, if we really believe and look to the fact that he lived, he died, he rose from the grave for us, for me. This is what has created this community. This community has not been created by some great entrepreneurial skills that have gathered a little group and we are building. A, this community has been created by the gospel. It is the conquering Christ who has created this. Anything else that does not fit into that reality is not of him. It's not cleaned up faces and cleaned up lives and this is, we don't, that's not our standing. Our standing is singular, that he lived and died and rose from the, from the grave for us. So that is our boast. So we teach it to each other. We proclaim it to one another. We, we seek by God's grace to take steps forward into that. So that we create a culture and a community here where, where we, we, we confess sins to each other. And you know how we do that? By, 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 by making it sense that when we do this, this is my sin, what we celebrate is, ah, but it has been conquered. It, that, that will not have the final say over you because someone paid for it. So it can be forgiven. In fact, you are no longer a slave to it. Do you know why? Because being united to Christ, as you have demonstrated today, you are set free from the power of sin. And the life you now live, you live through him. So listen, this sin that is still clawing at you, one day, you who has been released from its power will be fully removed from its presence forevermore. So we speak like that. We don't speak as those who are absolutely terrified about sin in that regard. As though there was nothing going on here that can address it. We encourage one another in that regard as we point each other to the reality that shall soon fully come to pass when our king sets his foot on this ground. And it shall be said that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his son, Christ. So I plead with you this, that whatever it is that you're fearing, would you look to the reality that Christ has worked, has wrought for you? Would you see the salvation of the Lord and quiet your heart? Because there is not a provision that has not been provided for you in the salvation that your Lord has worked for you. Father, we ask that you would pour out much faith into our hearts, even as your word has been read and prayed and preached that we would be those as a congregation who do not walk in fear. Would you allow for us to realize victories in personal lives, in marriages, in, in parenting, in advancing the gospel in our community, in sending out many from our congregation who will go out for the sake of your name amongst the nations, primarily because you have removed fear from our hearts. That you have given to us eyes to see your son and what he has accomplished for us as the one who has fought for us. Would you thus allow that the praises we praise here, that the boasting we boast of here, be never in ourselves, but be forever in the one who has conquered on our behalf. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.